Okay, so uh, <coughs> okay, so let's uh, resume uh, our lecture series, uh, and this is uh, lecture number five. Um, actually, we'll discuss part of that uh, lecture. <coughs> Uh, on uh, Monday, and uh, in, in today uh, I'm going to give two lectures actually, like stick together. Uh, the first one is um, continuing discussing about the convolutional based neural network, and the second <coughs> one will be about the problem machine learning. And uh, okay, so. <coughs> Uh, we've discussed a bit about why do we need a uh, convolution neural network over the uh, fully connected uh, deep uh, neural network and that's because the uh, deep neural network actually can capture only global information and res understand the correlation uh, among or between all the pixels to each other uh, and to solve the day actually or uh, the problem is that if we flip or if we rotate or translate the object of interest inside the image, then the deep neural network, uh, like the fully connected one, uh, will confuse. Okay. At the second day, then uh, we uh, introduced the concept of uh, local information capturing, and uh, we said, okay, we can actually design a, uh, a convolution neural network where we uh, introduce the concept of filters, and these filters actually can capture uh, only the local information. And then uh, the captured local information is being uh, mapped uh, just to uh, some uh, low dimension space. And then we flatten this uh, information, uh, local information. But then uh, the question is, how can we uh, construct from those local information a global information for the classification purposes? Like I have, <coughs> I have uh, more information or bunch of information about, for example, a nose, a mouth, ear, uh, tail, legs, and so on, but how do I know if I combine all this information together uh, that should be uh, an image for a dog or an image for a cat, and this, uh, the fully connected layers actually take, uh, take care of that one. Well, so <coughs> now we are uh, in our uh, step to just discuss how the, uh, how does the CNN works in detail. Well, so uh, what exactly the convolution is? So we have a 1D convolution, and the convolution is, is nothing but the output equals the input uh, times the kernel. And uh, this kernel actually carries some indices, and the index of that one is k. So assume that we have a one input uh, array, and this input has a dimension of 1 times 5. So what's 1? 1 is the number of the row, and 5 is the column. So we have 5 columns and 1 row. And then we have a filter, and this filter that the one that we've introduced uh, earlier. So this filter actually has only one index. The index is zero. So here, this is not the size. The k is not the size, it's, uh, k is only the index. So it ranges to zero, one, two, three, and so on. So index zero means that it's filter of size one. So uh, to perform actually the convolution operation, then we take the first, we just remove uh, the filter one step at a time and then we apply the convolution uh, operation so <clears throat> the output actually in this case would be the following so having 1 times 2 that gives you 2 2 times 2 gives you 4 3 times 2 gives you 6 etc etc so in this case uh, we have the input of dimension uh, uh, 1 or 5 uh, array uh, array of dimension 5 and we have only a filter of size 1 then the output is also the same dimension but in different information like the output is completely different well so now let's see the situation if we have a filter of size 2 this is all of this is still one dimensional convolution right so we don't have a matrix it's only one vector or one array <coughs> so in this case actually we move the two filters together at the time because here we perform a sum. 
So as you can see here, and so on. So I take the first, one times two, plus two times two, and that's to give you back six, right? And then move the filter one step forward. Repeat the convolution operation again. You have 10. One more step, you get 14. One more step, you got 18. And here, you can notice that we start with a dimension of 5, an array of dimension 5. And we have a kernel or a filter of dimension 2. So we end up actually with an output of dimension 4. Right? So we reduce the dimension. Here, just increase the filter. So we have a filter of dimension 3. Repeat again the same convolution, exactly the same. Move it one step forward at a time, and then you find that the output of, is of dimension 3. So if you remember what we said here about the construction of uh, this guy here, as far as we do convolution operation, we map the high dimensional data to a low dimension one. Like for example, here we start with 28 times 28 times 32, and then we end up with 28 times 28 uh, for each image, like the X and Y, and then we end up with the 7 times 7. So this is how the convolution actually reduce the dimension or map the high dimensional data into a lower dimension one. So that's, that's clear, right? Okay. So at some point, actually, uh, we want to keep the dimensions. Like for example, if you start with the first hidden layer or the first convolution layer, and then you have an image. And as you can see, if you, if you just do a convolution like this, maybe you lose the edges, the, the very far away edges uh, of the image. So what can we do, actually? We do what's called batting. So we bat the, uh, the image or the inputs with the zeros from uh, each dimension. And in this case, it just do the, uh, the step, uh, one step, uh, like the convolution again. So we have a three here, uh, like a three uh, vector filter of dimension three. And uh, then if you uh, repeat the convolution, so you start with the uh, dimension five, right, array, and then you add uh, padding. After you do the convolution, you end up with dimension five. So the padding is very, very important if you want to keep the dimension of the output. So the input will be the same dimension as the dimension of the output. At some points, any question, yes? Ah, okay, sorry. So at some point, uh, the dimension, uh, we need to keep the dimension the same. So if you just, uh, you can do it yourself or you just by I, it's a very simple uh, method. Well, so, uh, uh, so far we just discussed about this, like, uh, the, uh, what's called the stride. And the stride is that, uh, like, the step that we take, uh, or the step that we move the filter. So we, step the fil we move the filter only one step, right? So we move it only one step, one step, one step, or one pixel. But there's also an opportunity to increase the step size. So, and this step size is called the stride. So here, for example, if the strip, is step size of uh, a stride of uh, has, has, uh, equals three, then uh, you see that we end up only with uh, only two uh, two uh, outputs, like an uh, output of dimension two. So increasing the stride actually, or the step that we take, it also reduces the dimensions of the output array more and more. Well, so here is an equation that one might use. Uh, to uh, compute the output uh, if we uh, use some uh, uh, batting and also filter size and also a strike. So I'm sorry, but it's, uh, it's kind of, as you can see, it's kind of messy, but this is how we, when you just convert, I did this first by Keynote, but it's converted to PowerPoint and then we have some missing fonts and missing things like that, but I can explain. So uh, the convolution output actually equals the size of the input vector plus two times the bedding minus the filter size over the stride plus one. This is, should be the convolution output. So this is a very generic uh, rule that anybody can use. So please confirm it yourself. And uh, I gave you like a three example of this one. 
So here uh, we start with actually uh, an input of dimension one, two, three, four, five. We have a filter of dimension one, and uh, the output is say one, two, three, four, five. No padding. So here the input is for a five plus zero minus one over one plus one and that gives you five right very simple yes same here so if you increase that one batting is zero then this gives you four and if you include the batting it gives you this uh, five back here. well so so far that was about the one uh, uh, one D that was 1D convolution, like I have only one array. But what about the images, like a 2D convolution? It's exactly the same. You just increase the dimension. So instead of having this in one dimension, now we have it in the two dimensions. right? So repeat this again in two dimensions. So if I have more depth image, like image, for example, and not the color, but uh, sorry, not binary image, like a grayscale image, but then we have a color image, then we have to do this in all the dimensions. So uh, x, y, and then in green, x, y, and red, x, y, and uh, so I'm going to discuss this. So here, uh, this is a convolution, and this is more a realistic one, because this one reminds you with the image, right? So this is how the image looks, looks like. And then we have a batting here over the image. And we have actually a convolution filter of dimension three. So the convolution filter is of dimension three times three. Right? So x is equals three and y equals three, right? And uh, now if you want to com uh, compute the output when we do a convolution, uh, a 2D convolution of this image, so uh, now we have exactly the same rule, exactly the same. So the convolution output is the size of the input vector or the input matrix in this case, plus two times the padding minus the filter size over the stride plus one. So the, here we have a matrix of dimension five sum five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So this is the input, uh, this is the input uh, matrix. It's of dimension five. And then we have a batting uh, of dimension one. So this is two times the batting, one and one, uh, minus the filter size. And this is the filter here. It has a dimension of three times three, right? Over the stride, and the stride now is two. If you, if you see here, we move the filter, not at each step, but each two steps, okay? And if you compute that, then you find that the output is of dimension three times three. So this is a very generic uh, uh, equation, and it holds for any high dimension uh, convolution operation. But in um, in very generic, this is how it looks like, uh, and how you compute and how you do just decrease or lower the dimension when you do oper uh, convolution operation. Well, another concept is called pooling. Pooling actually is very, very important in uh, convolutional based neural network. And there are there are two kinds of pooling. I think those are the more standard one. And if I remember correctly, uh, those are the two types of pooling. And the pooling actually is that we have a max maximum pooling and average pooling. So it's also another, and the, the main importance of this pooling I'm going to discuss in a moment in the next slides, but let me actually describe what is the pooling here. So the pooling actually, we, we consider a matrix, for example, as a dimension two times two, and the maximum pooling is that we take the maximum number in this filter. So here, for example, uh, having this two times two filter, and then it's uh, the maximum pooling, then we have the maximum number, which is 20. Moving the pooling filter to the right, then the maximum number here in this here is 30. We put it here. Moving the the the, uh, the pooling uh, uh, filter down, then we have the maximum number is 37. Moving to the left, then we have the maximum number is 112. So this is the maximum pooling. We have also another uh, kind of operation is called average pooling, 
and for the average boolean you just do the average of the uh, uh, the numbers and do the curve so you just sum 12 plus 20 plus 8 plus 12 and then you get the average which is basically 13 move the filter here and they can compute and so on and so forth but why do we need to do boolean okay so as you can see here for example for the maximum boolean uh, or the max boolean is that we take only the big, the big source that has the max uh, the maximum uh, number right or the maximum value and those big souls ac actually are the big souls of the object itself right so you remember when we just transform the image like for example the image of three when we transform this one like here i can show you it here like here so those are one takes the value of one and uh, the rest of the pixels are zero so when we do uh, a, a maximum pooling actually or max pooling then uh, we make the model actually concentrates on the uh, on the most important object of the, of the uh, inside the image and not all of this uh, other stuff which is not uh, most important so the pooling actually is very important in this case well so now uh, again how we do we update the weights right so we know the filters and those filters carry some number and then we need those filters to capture some local information which are which are important information so how we uh, force these filters to capture this information by just minimizing the loss function and doing the back propagation as we've done exactly in the same in the case of the body connected neural network so uh, if you remember correctly when we do the path propagation, we compute the gradient in the case of the fully connected neural network, and then we use the chain rule to compute the gradient, if you remember correctly. But now, how can we compute the gradient in this case? Because we have the convolution layers, and then we have filters. These filters not talk to each other. So how can we compute the path propagation in this case? Then I leave that for yourself, be right. Uh, if you fail to... to, to, to uh, to do this computation, which is, it's not, it's just like a tedious computation, then you have to be sometimes to do, just do all the calculations, then please let me know and then I'll give you the PDF that contains all the detailed uh, calculation, how to do the back propagation and compute the gradient in the case of the convolution neural network. But actually it's important to do, to do so. Well, so again, this is uh, the image that I showed before. Then we have this filter actually, and this filter scan all the, uh, the image and then once it found the image that matched the, uh, the information that he's looking for, then it, it reports here to the matrix the number or the maximum number it captured. And uh, actually, <coughs> and, uh, actually, the main importance of the bad propagation uh, is that we find actually the weights, uh, like what is the numbers of this kernel, such that this kernel actually, or this filter, is able to capture the information, uh, important information into the image. Well, so again, the overfitting problem. So even if you try to do the model and now you understand everything, the concept of the pooling, the concept of the convolution, and of course the fully connected layer, we still have the, our main ever problem, which is the overfitting. So uh, how now, uh, now how can we avoid overfitting? And in the case of the, uh, the uh, for the convolution neural network, as we deal with this uh, image, then uh, actually you give the image to the computer, or you give your face to the computer, and then the computer actually recognizes your face. So in here, this guy tried the model or trained the model actually to learn the image of cat, and then uh, because of the overfitting, when he test uh, test his model just to facing or give a new image to computer, the computer predicts it's a bot. So this is kind of overfitting problem. And uh, may I ask you uh, how we did? Ah, oh, shit, I wrote it here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wrote the solution, so that's mm -hmm. my question, sorry. Okay, so, okay, so uh, there are a bunch of, uh, bunch of ways actually to avoid the overfitting. Uh, one of them is to use the L1 over L2 regularization, that uh, is uh, the uh, regularization uh, terms, uh, the penalty term that we use for the uh, polynomial model, and also we could use what's called the airless looping, and this uh, I'm going to discuss. Uh, random dropout is also I'm going to discuss, or data augmentation. Uh, so those those three are new ones, are new techniques I'm going to discuss in a moment. 
So the airless topping, what's exactly the airless topping? So we've seen that uh, very famous uh, plot and diagram shot many times. And uh, the here, this is the, uh, the epochs or the complexity of the model, and this is the loss function. And for example, we start with here. Here is not a good area, and then also here we start to overfit. Like here it's an underfitting area, and here overfitting area. And then we try to measure uh, such that we just we want to stick here. So we can actually find this uh, area here, which is the, the training and the validation uh, very close together. And we can achieve this very easily uh, by tensorflow.keras, the callbacks.ls topic. So we don't have to do this. As far as you know how to do Python coding, then uh, you have the magic in your hand. So this, this is the function that you can use, actually. And then the model actually find the best, uh, best uh, area to stop. Uh, to stop to stop anymore. Uh, another technique which is called the random dropout. And uh, this random dropout is that, like for example, in the case it works for the case of fully connected layer or even in the convolution neural network where we have this fully connected layer. And random dropout is that we turn off randomly uh, some of the connection of uh, some of the neuron. So as you can see here, everything is fully connected to each other. But here we drop off some of the uh, weights, the connected weights. So this is exactly as if you just uh, trying to to have uh, to study some problem or to solve some problem, and you focus on that problem. You really focus on that, and then somebody there, hey, hey, look at this, look at that, and so it's actually distorts your focus. This is exactly the same here because we don't want the model to focus too much on learning the input data, otherwise it learn not even the data, but also it's learning the noise inside the data, and this is what we don't want to uh, happen. So we do some distortion on the concentration on the, or in the focus when we uh, teach the model uh, to learn the information about the input data. Uh, yes? How much is the drop? How much ah, this is a hyperparameter. You have to try to solve. So every time you just assume, OK, I have a drawback rate of, uh, of for example, 4.2. Uh, this is the rate. So if you have a good accuracy at the end, then it's okay, fine. Otherwise, you have to try it. There is, uh, there is, uh, there is like this. Uh, this is here. Like, oh, I it. have to specify the rate. Yes. So this is the function tensorflow that caress uh, the layer drop out, and then you have to specify so the rate. There is no like algorithm to find the rate. No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> then there is no need for you for the data scientist. <laughs> and the machine learning can can do actually everything, so. Okay, another way of that, which is exactly, in my opinion, exactly similar to the dropout, uh, is exactly the uh, data augmentation. And uh, the data augmentation is, for example, as we train the model on some image, then we try to do some, uh, like, operation on those images. Like, for example, we do some vertical for them, or uh, we change actually the, the, the bright or the brightness of the image. Uh, we do some noise, we could add some noise, we could have, add some grayscale, or we can crop the image. Also, we could do some blurring, or we could do some random uh, rotation like uh, 45 degree rotation. But why we do that? Because actually, we wanted the model first of all to generalize to all kinds of uh, image. Like, for example, who knows that when I, do th I train the model on this image? But when I try to test actually the image, maybe the cat, the image of cat, of cat it has a flat one or a tinted one or something like that. So this is why we do the data augmentation, and data augmentation is very, very important uh, if we deal with the image. Well, so uh, so far we've talked about the only one channel, but uh, the color, the image actually it has a three channels, like the uh, red, green, and blue, and this is called the RG. So, uh, and all of them just stack together. So if you, if you stack those uh, three images together, then you get this image. But here, this is the difference. Like, uh, the dimension of this one are the length and width times three with this one. And three is one, two, three. So here we have a gloss. Maybe it's not, uh, it's not very, quite clear. But here, the, the dimension is the length times the width times one. So there is no depth in this image. It's only one dimension. But again, uh, for example, back to this uh, our image, 
I show you when I split that one, uh, the three different, if we go back, uh, the three different, uh, the three different phases of these images, of this image, which are the blue one here, the red one, and the green one. And uh, if you decompose all of them, then you give back the information. And if you uh, just give it a, a little bit deeper look, then you find that each of those image carry some information in this one. So, for example, if you have a ghost here. For example, if the ghost that exists, and then you have some ghost in the color image, if you just uh, split the basis, then you maybe discover this ghost in some of those images. So like here, for example, you see the green one capture uh, some information and some uh, hidden information that's not captured in the, uh, in the original image, not even in the other business images. So that's, that's really important. The color image uh, give us uh, the freedom and give us more and more information uh, about what's going on inside. Also, as you can see here, this is the uh, this is the, 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 the spray of the water over here. And it's clearly here. It is clearly here and here, but in the red one, uh, it's not exist. Yes. I have a question. Maybe unrelated to this. But we human only see. Not related to this one. A little bit. Maybe it is a little bit. That we human only see in three colors. That, that is where it comes from. But some other animal have like. Uh, can see more more colors. See color in as a linear combination in more than these three colors. So is there is like some some something like that in machine learning? Yeah, if you if you design a machine learning, for example, for a snake or for a horse, so if the horse is going to bait you, then you can find this one. But if a human no, no, is going to bait you, then you don't need that. One. Uh, no, but but we can like uh, in in astronomy. We don't care about animals. In application, no no no. In in application, like. It will have more information. So no, it's only the three. This is the three colors. Uh, this is for us. Yes. But, but there is, like, I read about it that in some studies they study the, the eyes of some other animals that have m more sensitivity to colors than us. So the, they see more information than us. Okay, so as a, as, a, as, a, as a scientist, right? So we have the freedom to do whatever we want. And, so, so and also we have the freedom to do whatever we want as far as we have the uh, optimal solution, right? So here you can decompose three colors, right? But you can also do more. Like for example, I can com I can decompose the three colors, but I can also decompose the binary one to them. So uh, you are free to do whatever you want. The, the decomposition actually uh, is not that hard, right? Because we know how to do that here. Like for example, uh, even in this one, in the convolutions, when we do convolution, we know how to do the convolution. So it, it is independent on uh, the, compl the complexity of the model. So you can keep adding more and more as far as you find this, uh, uh, this decomposition actually can solve it today or give you the optimal solution. Uh, but this is the interesting case for us, or this is the most interesting uh, case for uh, yeah, actually, well, three it's colors. A, yeah, actually it's only the three colors. This is the, if you deal with the real image uh, for you. Uh, okay, good. So uh, for the binary, actually, uh, uh, well, we have a poor image, poor information into the image, so we don't have the freedom to learn more about what's going on inside the image, and this is how it looks like. So, for example, you can see that the spray of the water, part of the leg, they just they come. So, uh, this is why it's really, really important uh, to deal with the uh, image with the depth, uh, which has different colors, than dealing with this binary image. So, if you look here, for example, you have information about this and this and that, here we don't have this one information in the grayscale image. Uh, also, uh, if you look at the, uh, for example, the face of the horse, again, you, can, you don't have any details over here, right? So all the details, like the nose, the eyes, they, they, they're just gone. But here you can find uh, all of them, like a very deep details, especially if you decompose uh, all the three pieces of the colors together, then you have a very detailed information about these things. So this is uh, just a, uh, 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 this is slide actually, it's just to uh, motivate you and convince you why do you need a color image, uh, not the grayscale image, because in the color image we have more and more information, those information may be easily lose, lost uh, if we do not the only uh, binary image or grayscale image. Well, so now how do we could do the convolution in the case of the color image, we just sum over all the, all the, uh, all, all the pieces image. 
uh, and for example here you can do whatever you want so you can keep adding more and more uh, bases uh, to the image and because at the end you sum over all of them well so the task here this is an example and uh, this example is called smiley faces and uh, in this case we actually uh, the task is that to, to construct a convolution neural network model to uh, classify the smiley faces so I gave you like a facial uh, uh, images, and then these facial images, you are uh, required to construct a convolution neural network to identify either this face actually or this image contains a smiley face or not. Uh, so this is actually how do uh, I construct this model uh, in here, and at the end we have only one output, and this output actually this is the output neuron is actually tells you or oh, it quantify or uh, it carry the probability of the input image uh, being contained an image or a face that is smiling or not. Well, so as as always, we should have done some uh, data pre-processing, right? Or image pre-processing. Because we are interested only in the uh, facial expression of the human, right? So like the pixels on the, uh, on the mouth, the eyes, how the eyes looks like then we don't need more information or all, all the other information. So we need to group the image to contain only the face here. So this is at the end what we end up with. And also we do some rotation and adjustment for the color and adjustment for the size because at the end I need to end up with this image. Image that contains only and only the face of the human. Only this one with the same size. So all the images should, should have the same size. And for data augmentation, of course, to avoid the overfitting, we could have the random group, random flip, uh, resizing, etc., etc. So we could have uh, this uh, all the uh, all of this uh, augmentation. And to find uh, this uh, bunch of available augmentation, then you can just type the augmentation TensorFlow or augmentation Batwash, and then you find all the all the processes that you can do uh, when dealing with the data augmentation. So after you train the model. Uh, uh, you can find actually you can report that the loss and the accuracy and uh, those are the two important charts that we ever focus on so the first one is the loss and as far as we keep training the model you see that how the loss function is decreasing and also for the uh, accuracy you see how the accuracy on the other hand is uh, increasing so and now my question for you guys now I have these uh, two plots do I accept the predictions of this model or not. Like I have an accuracy uh, with almost 90%. This is the chart, but this is the distribution for the training, and this is the distribution for the validation. So uh, is that model is good enough to describe the spider faces or not? I can see what's the number of the y axis. The y axis, you can see. I can see the top numbers. You can see. Yeah. Okay, it's so it's ninety percent over here, and uh, this one is almost open too. Here. Yes, please. Yeah, please don't be shy. You just have uh, the answer. What's what? Uh, okay. From my know, uh, I there was uh, that one seminar in, in, the, in my department. The project was machine using machine learning and something. So most of the accuracy that they, uh, they put in the slide was over uh, 95. Okay, so, so maybe there is a better, a better model. Of course, there is a better, but I'm asking about yeah. does this prop, this model uh, face some problems? So is it a good or bad? That's the uh -huh. question. So does it have problems or not? Yes. At the end of both graphs, it seems we're going to lose uh, uh, validation. We're going to gain validation loss and lose validation accuracy. Like here? Yes. Yeah, but both of them are the same, right? So you have the train and you have the validation and both are okay. So, it's okay. That's okay? It's okay. <laughs> yes. Sure. This model is good. Yeah, no problem. Like, yeah, yeah. Okay. If the model is not good, then you should have find some so spiky so behavior. Maybe the validation is under the training. This is then we have an overfitting, or maybe you have like an accuracy around sixty percent or seventy percent. But this one with the uh, above ninety-five, this is only in the scientific case. But in the real world, 
if we have around 80, 80, 85, that's more than enough. Because the data, or the real data, are much complicated than the data on the scientific side. Well, so this is the prediction. We need to do some predictions. So uh, here, this is what's called the uh, GT. Uh, GT here means that this is ground truth. So that means the true value that I know. So the uh, GT here, or the ground truth, that this face is not smiling. And the prediction to be smile is 58%. This face, the ground truth, is not a smiley. And the prediction to be smiley is 44%. So this is a good prediction, right? So it's not smiley, and it's also not smiley. This guy is not smiley, and we have a prediction of 1%. And so on and so forth. Then this is how we can uh, find our make a predictions of your model. Well, so that's uh, that's all, and then uh, I have what's called transfer learning, uh, contrastive learning, CKA similarity, sparsity in the image on the images, but I will not discuss all of this. So let's go to the uh, lecture number six. That's if you want, to. sorry. Okay, can you just cover it quickly? Transfer learning. Transfer learning. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the transfer learning. Ah, uh, please. If you uh, if you find anything of those interesting, please let me know so I can give you information about this. So the transfer learning is that. Okay. So uh, uh, training large data is of course computationally expensive, right? And um, instead of uh, like I have a millions of millions of data, then I have to construct from scratch a machine learning model that also find or understand the features of this data, of this data right? But although on the other hand, I can find uh, a list of models that pre-trained, and it's on the uh, GitHub of the TensorFlow or in the GitHub of the PyTorch, they did that. But they, this actually these models uh, classify or deal with different kind of image. So I can use this pre-trained model and just to change the output and the input layer and keep everything the same. And instead of training a whole model from scratch, then I have to train only two things. So this kind of transfer learning uh, is very, very famous. And uh, people in uh, computer science and the company uh, rely on this kind of transfer learning, not to just uh, waste your uh, computational resources in training everything from scratch. Any other stuff here before we go to the quantum stuff? OK. Okay, so we have only 50 minutes to finish this talk. So I'm going to go through it uh, very quick. And uh, if you are interested in something, please just uh, slow me down. Okay, so this is all about the quantum machine learning and uh, quantum computation, quantum gates, and this is supposed to be the last lecture in this crash course. Well, so uh, in 1982, Richard Feynman actually has the dream is just to replace the uh, classical simulation with the quantum one. But actually, he didn't know how to do that. But now, right? So this is a real quantum computer, a uh, computer from IBM. And the current situation in IBM is that the, their computer actually has a 200 qubits. And they promise after two years, they will double this number. So after two years, IBM will have a quantum computer that contains 400 qubits. So uh, just to motivate you about the quantum computation, uh, I gave you an example which is called the quantum maze. So assuming that you have a maze, and this maze actually has only one entrance and uh, one output. And then uh, if you try uh, a classical computer just to solve the path, uh, the best of the optimal path uh, to go outside the maze, then the, the classical computers actually would try all the paths sequentially. Like you take the first route until it hits some uh, no solution, like uh, 
not a good solution and try another another route. So it's sequentially solved the problem. But in quantum machine learning or quantum computers, it tried all possible roads at the same time, and then at the end, it has only uh, gives you uh, the uh, optim optimal one. So this is actually uh, just to motivate you uh, about the uh, why do we need or why the quantum computers are of most important. Well, so the quantum computers actually it just uses a bunch of binary gates, right? So you know all of these kind of things. So we have this transistor, which is a B, uh, AB junction or BNP junction. So of course, we know all of that. And then you just add more and more to construct the CPU. And as far as we keep adding more and more of the CPUs to our classic computers, then its ability to perform a faster computation. But again, this is you have seen before. So as this is show you a chart of the uh, the x-axis is the year. So starting from 1970 uh, until 2020, this is the number of the transistors. This one into the CPU. And as you can see here, we have around a 10 to uh, 7, 10 to the power 7 transistor and only one CPU. And that's really, really big number. And at some point, we will not be able to increase this number more because of the atomic size. So this is why we need another way that we need another reason that we need a quantum computation or quantum computer. So how many uh, just quantum computers exist? There are lots of them. Here I'm just giving exam, uh, examples of uh, just a, a, a very few of them, but there are many, many of them. So there is a photonic quantum computer, and this photonic quantum computer is actually it uses the polarization states of the photons to store and process some information. And also the superconducting quantum computers, which use some uh, electric uh, circuits, uh, which is uh, designed from some superconducting materials to do some uh, quantum computing. There is also what's called trapped ions, and this is used in computation on the ions. Uh, and what we are going to discuss, our main uh, uh, topic here, is what's called the quantum dots. And the quantum dots actually, it creates a dot, or a cave for the electron, such that you trap the electron inside, and then you can access the spin state of the electron, and you can do all the operation that you need on this electron. Like flip the states, or rotate the electron, or do whatever you so we are going, this is our main uh, topic here, is the quantum dot types of quantum computers. There is also another type uh, which is called quantum annealers, and this quantum annealers, it's different than the quantum dot because there is no gate over here. So we control the qubit or the, the evaluation of the uh, evolution of the Hamiltonian by adding some electromagnetic pulses uh, on this quantum dots, but here for the quantum annealer, we leave everything. We leave the evolution, the time evolution, of the Hamiltonian of the electron until it hits its ground state. Uh, and yes. in IBM and the Google, we have quantum dots. Uh, quantum dots, yes. Uh, for quantum annealers, they have a, another company, it's called the D Wave Company. Okay, so as uh, the main topic here is about the quantum dot, so the question now is how to perform. Uh, computation on a quantum dot, so we need to see how can we first construct the quantum dots, right? So in a, uh, a semiconducting confinement hole, uh, hole uh, where a single electron can be trapped. So while this electron is trapped into this hole, then we can add more electromagnetic or electromagnetic pulses like uh, on here, such that we can control the evaluation or the evolution of the Hamiltonian of the system. And uh, uh, controlling the qubits or the electron in the in the quantum dot, it's called a gate operation. So the question now is, how do we can or can we cook the quantum dot? Well, so starting from what's called a single electron box. Here you have a source, you have a drain, and also you have extra gates with some extra voltage. And as far as you have uh, the source, actually, which is like the donors and the receiver of the electrons. So as far as you close here, or you just uh, lower the, 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 the voltage of this gate, then the electron actually can tunnel uh, from the source to the drain. But please note that this is kind of, kind of island, right? So the electron actually can jump 
at a time because the value exclusion principle, right? So starting with a source that contains lots of electrons, and also we have the gate over here, which has a like a, a, a higher uh, potential or higher energy, and then we have the drain. In this case, there is no tunneling here uh, of the electron between the source and the drain. As far as we lower down the voltage of the uh, of the dot uh, or of the uh, this here, uh, then the electron actually can tunnel here from the source to the panel dot, but. Because of the bowel exclusion principle, then it's not possible for two electrons actually to stay in one dot, and unless we have a, a large volume of this one, or the, the size of the dot is very, very large. But here, there, it's only one electron that jumps into, uh, into the quantum dot at a time. And if we just, uh, if we just increase that one here, uh, like we decrease the energy, or the, again, the, 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 the voltage of the dot, then we can trap the electron inside the dot. So here we have a trapped electron. And to make the electron actually jump from the source to the drain, then we have to increase again the voltage of the, uh, of the dot such that the electron just to jump from here to here. And this is actually, and this is called the threshold uh, voltage over the column blockade. So this is show you how actually the voltage and this is how this uh, the electron just jump from here to there. So this is uh, like an electron density uh, color map, and as you can see here, this is the gate voltage and this is the current. And the point is that it's a spike here. You see. So what that tells us? It's quantized. Hmm? It's quantized. Huh? It's quantized. Quantized. What, what exactly is quantized? Going the integer numbers. Huh? Going the integer numbers. Yes, but why? Uh, who knows? Yeah, this is this is what I said. Yes. They cannot jump in, 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 in couple. It's only one electron jump, and then one electron just leave the dot, and then another electron goes in. Mm -hmm. And this is why you have these spikes. All right? Okay? So and instead of uh, just, uh, there are two, two kind of things over here. So this is the one that we've seen here. So this is the gate voltage, and this is the current. Because if the electron jump from the source to the drain, then we have a current, right? Yes. Good. So uh, this one, uh, the down blot here, this this one here, this one here, is that. So we have the current, and we have the voltage. And as far as the electron jump in the dot and leave the dot, then we have this spike of the. Uh, then we feel some current uh, running into the uh, circuit, and and so on and so forth. But we still have also the voltage of the uh, drain and source. So if you plot actually the voltage uh, of the drain and source uh, versus the voltage of the gate, then you have this uh, kind of diamond chain. And this diamond chain actually, it shows here the pikes at this transition or the connections between the diamonds each other. So in here, we have a current running. Here we have a current, here we have a current, here we have a current. But inside this one, there is no current, right? So from this, we know, actually, we can know uh, the, uh, the, the voltage, or here, the voltage of the source and the voltage of the drain, as well as the voltage of the gate, such that we can construct the one point, right? So there is no current running inside here. So here, it's a very suitable place as a cave for electrons to stay in, and then we can control with all, all of these electromagnetic pulses, and we do all the uh, uh, rotation on these uh, qubits. But is the probability for electron to jump even in this condition is zero, or it is very close to zero? It's very close to zero. Close. There is no probability zero, of course. Ah, so it's very close. Uh, this is what's called, it is still some noisy in the quantum computers, and this is one of the problems. So this is all kind of problem in quantum computers. Okay, so again, this is what's called the column diamond. And the column diamonds, as you can see, this is uh, the diamonds uh, that I show you here, and this is, are the actual cages for the electron to be trapped uh, inside. And uh, in here and in there, like all this blue, uh, cells here, there is a current running, 
So we are not in the point of dots. Uh, only on those uh, diamonds here, we are in a point of dots. So th those are very suitable places where we can trap the electron and do our quantum combination. Uh, here, this is a uh, uh, like a, a real uh, color image uh, for experiment. I think this is a, a silicon material and uh, you can uh, access this uh, information from this uh, the paper uh, is here the url of the paper is here and as you can see the current here if the current is running so here we have the uh, highest current uh, moving uh, on this uh, red area while this um, magenta i think i guess is the uh, no current batting and this is all the cages the suitable cages to combine them well, so this is also another example or real examples of uh, different quantum dots. Uh, so in here we have a dot, uh, but this dot has a large size such that it can contain <coughs> a hundred electrons at once inside. So this is a very big dot, and this very old construction of the quantum dot, and we don't use that one recently. So uh, and this is uh, 1996, so this is very old. Uh, and also the, the size of the dot is uh, 400 nanometers, so this is very large. Although for only one uh, electron, uh, we have this, and this is, has been constructed on, or um, has been, yeah, has been uh, developed in uh, uh, a year of uh, 2000. Uh, for 2003, we know actually, or people knows, uh, like the Alzheimer group, knows how to construct uh, double dot. And uh, this double dot actually is very important because with this double dot we can do the entanglement. And I'm going to show you uh, after a couple of slides how can one make entanglement using these double dots. And also we have a treble dots and the recent one, uh, which is uh, 2016, I think it is uh, uh, ZCAC, is, is from IBM Group. And in 2016, they were able to just uh, have this uh, 12 uh, quantum dots. Here, this is a 9, and this is a 3 uh, read out uh, dots, quantum dots. Okay, so now we know actually how to cook the quantum dot. The question is, how do, do, how do we do computations on this, on the constructed quantum dots? Well, so in general, when we do any quantum computation, first we have to initialize the qubits in the zero state. So assuming that we have a two qubit system, uh, then how many uh, states do we have? Four. Exactly. Base. Two to the power n. Uh, so we have uh, four states or four bases. And uh, first we have to initialize the qubits to be uh, in the zero state. And of course, you know, we have to just converge to some optimal solution. Then we have to repeat the experiment again and again. And then we have this distribution. And then you can take the average or take the mean as your solution. And repeating the experiment many times, this is in uh, quantum machine learning is called the number of shots. So you do more shots, and then you have the uh, the output. And of course, the precise measurements of your outputs depends on the square root of the number of shots, one of the square root. And then after that, after you initialize the qubits, then you do some uh, processing on the qubits such that you have a time evolution of the Hamiltonian. And this is how the function looks like uh, mostly when you do this uh, computation on the quantum computers. And then at the end, you just measure the expectation value on one of the uh, bases, uh, like the computational basis or the plus or minus basis, whatever basis you want to measure. And this is how it looks like. But the question now is that, how, how do we control the qubits, right? So does anybody know how to control the qubits? Like what can we do to control the qubits, for example? To flip it or to retain it? Does anybody know how, can the, how this can happen? <laughs> hmm? Of course, of course, and this is what I'm going to show you. How, like, from the experiment, or from the experiment in the theory, how can we control the qubits, and how can we do this cooperation? Well, so starting from the Zeeman effect. So the Zeeman effect, what Zeeman effect says, says that if you have a, a magnetic field, a static magnetic field, and then you apply this magnetic field, starting magnetic field on an electron, then the electron is going to split its uh, energy state. Yeah. So it has two states, the higher state and the lower state, and those are the two states of the electron, and the uh, energy gap between the two states actually is h bar omega, 
uh, and where the omega is basically the gamma e b z over h bar, and the gamma z is the uh, is that factor which is quantified uh, the coupling of prints uh, between the uh, uh, the liquid state states and the uh, and uh, of course, with, in the bare sense uh, of the magnetic field, we have two states, right? And then there is a uh, probability like half and half to be here or there. Uh, sorry, the probability, it's have a definite probability to be in the, in the first state or in the second state. But if we do not apply this field, like this is a static magnetic field, then the probability of the electron is half and half to be in each of the state because we don't have a split of the two states. And of course, you can uh, define or you can uh, write the zero states as the high energetic states, which is one and zero, and the uh, lower states is uh, zero and one, and those are called spinner representation of the states. Well, so to know now how to control the qubit uh, rotation, uh, of course, we need, besides the uh, static or the DC magnetic field, we need an extra AC magnetic field. So you need an oscillating magnetic field, extra oscillating magnetic field. And uh, this oscillating mag magnetic field has to be applied uh, orthogonal to the static magnetic field. Uh, and uh, doing so, then we hit what's called Rabi oscillation. So anybody of you heard of this Rabi oscillation? Yes, please. You know what? Okay, so uh, Rabi oscillation actually uh, it describes a, um, a two particle or couple two particle system where the uh, frequency, uh, like the oscillating frequency, actually can be described by rotating or irradiating some of the field. And uh, to do so, actually, or to understand the, the qubit dynamics or the dynamics of the qubit, we need first to understand what is uh, Rabi oscillation how, or, or how Rabi oscillation describes the, the system of the two qubits, of the one qubit of two states. Well, so as I said, to control the qubit rotation, we need an extra AC magnetic field beside the DC magnetic field. So the DC magnetic field, assume that it's in applied in the Z direction, then uh, with this, uh, this frequency of B0, and then we could have also an extra uh, AC magnetic field that is in the uh, direction X. And that field, actually, it has the amplitude of B1, frequency omega, and time T plus some phase 1. So now I can write actually the Hamiltonian in the left frame uh, as the uh, H node for this one for the DC magnetic field and H1 for the AC magnetic field, which it looks like this one. Where exactly the omega zero or omega node and omega one are the frequencies of both of them. So this chart actually shows you the differences or the different states, like the one state and the zero states. And then we have, this is for example, you can think of this as the, uh, as the omega node actually because we you, you see here right so this is the omega and uh, that split the two states and then also you have the omega one which is the uh, the one from the AC magnetic field and we have the delta omega which is the differences between them and now our task is how can we adjust omega node omega one and delta omega such that we control the Rabi oscillation this oscillation like these are the oscillation of the qubits between the zero state and the one state. So we need actually to see what are the values of the omega node, omega one, and then the omega, such that we can control the qubits, right? For example, to keep it in zero state or in the one state, and so on and so forth. Okay. So to do so, actually, uh, uh, wait. So uh, to do so, we need actually uh, to do this uh, the uh, time-independent uh, Schrodinger picture. So uh, to understand the, the Rabi oscillation, we need to go from the time-dependent time-independent Schrodinger picture. But how can we do that by introducing what's called the rotating frames? So you have a frame that rotates exactly with the same uh, conditions as the qubits uh, to describe uh, your Hamiltonian. 
And after actually really, really tedious calculations, yeah. then you can find the Hamiltonian in the rotating frame, which has this formula. And from here, you can find that this, those are the off diagonal terms over here, which are proportional to the cosine and the sine. Uh, and those are the, uh, the, the two terms actually that are responsible for this kind of oscillation, like uh, 0 and 1 and 0 and 1. And uh, one can find actually a generic form of the Hamiltonian for the rotating frame, where the, uh, the Hamiltonian of the rotating frame is 1 over 2 omega t uh, n uh, dot sigma. n is the axis of, this, uh, of the rotation of the qubit. And sigma are the uh, vector of sigma, like the three bounded uh, matrices, the sigma a, sigma y, and sigma z. And the omega is called, in this case, is called the rapid frequency, and the t is a time. So you can define the omega this way. Well, so here, uh, we need actually to specify uh, the wave function at a certain time, like uh, the qubit will exactly the qubit at a certain time. So you can find actually, this is the, uh, the equation of that one, uh, which is proportional to some co cosine omega t and sine omega t, uh, state zero and sine omega t in the, in the state of one plus some phase. And uh, with the probability of measuring the electron state one, it's basically this one here, I'm sorry, I, I just missed this one here. Okay, so this is the probability. And this probability actually equals omega one over two omega, big omega, times one minus cosine omega t over two. With, of course, the rapid frequency from the previous slide is, uh, defines this one. So if you keep a closer look here, this is an arbitrary time unit. So if we change actually the omega or the delta omega uh, to be 0.5 omega one or to be uh, the same as omega one, then you see that we have a dumping distribution. The distribution of the, just the oscillation is dumped. But if you keep the delta omega equals zero, then we have a probability of jumping from the zero state to the one state. So that's a very important notation, and this is called the in resonance case. So the in resonance case, we have the maximal probability and the maximal frequency of rabbit oscillation, such that the qubits or the two system can be completely switched. So in this case, we have the delta omega equals zero, and the big omega, or the rapid frequency, is omega one over two. And the probability of having the qubit in the first state, in the one state, is one minus cosine omega t over two, while the uh, probability of having the qubit in the zero state is one plus or cosine omega t over two, and these are actually the maximal uh, rapid oscillation. So to control the qubit, and now to have exactly the flip from the zero state to the one state, we need the delta omega to be zero. That means the uh, frequency of the two, the AC and DC magnetic field has to be equal. So this is, this is one condition that uh, we should have noticed. Okay. okay. So uh, now I uh, can see that the, uh, the the static and magnetic fields actually define the orientation of the qubits, and uh, of course having delta omega zero, then the, the Hamiltonian can be described in this way, where the Na is the axis of the rotation. So in this case, we have only two variables, uh, the omega t and the phi, uh, where we have one axis of the rotation, and then we can rotate the qubits on that around this axis. And uh, uh, actually, another things over here. Okay, so this slide. Uh, sorry, I missed that. Okay, so now uh, instead of having the probability of being in the state zero or the state one, we can measure actually the expectation value uh, of the qubit uh, on the computational basis. So we need to uh, apply some sigma z of the matrix, right? To measure the expectation value. And the expectation value of the qubit being in the state zero or zero or uh, state one uh, can be defined as the probability of being in the state zero minus the probability of the state one. And that actually uh, has the a value of cosine omega t. So if you plot uh, the expectation value uh, on the computational basis for the qubits, and then you can find that it will be in the a state one if the, uh, for example, the uh, this omega is zero, and then it will be on the state uh, zero uh, if the omega is one, uh, sorry, is y, and so on and so forth.
Okay, so and uh, from here we have what's called the buy pulses. So the buy pulses actually from here they shows you how can you uh, if you have a, an electron or a qubit in the one state, then by uh, applying an AC magnetic field with the omega here equals to y, like the rabbit frequency equals uh, uh, omega one over two and this uh, omega t equals y, then you completely flip it from the one state to the zero state or from the zero state. To does that remind you with, with uh, something? Yes. Yes. And if you change the value, like uh, not the by box, but if you keep it as uh, by over 2, that gives you the y. Okay? So hopefully now you have a, a clear and connected vision uh, from, the experimental th uh, from the experimental side to the theoretical side how these gates have been constructed. Okay? Okay, so uh, to define the uh, blochosphere or the uh, basis of the qubit, uh, then um, uh, the, uh, the we have uh, we need only two uh, variables or two angles like theta and phi, and we need the axis of the rotation. Uh, so the qubit actually, or the state of the qubit, which is oriented, uh, which is the psi, uh, can be described as cosine theta over 2, uh, the state 0, uh, plus e to the i phi sine theta over 2 uh, to the state 1. And from here you can access all information on the qubit. Uh, and of course, uh, we have a different basis, so if you change the value of the axis, then you uh, actually have a different basis. Like for example, the computational basis, is the, you have the n-axis is 0, 0, plus 1, right? So that should be this one, right? And if you just apply that one here, you find that you have this state up and state down, like state up and state down. If you change now the, 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 the basis, for example, of the n, of this n, to the plus state, which is plus 1, 0, and 0, this one, and you just take the value of the theta and phi, substitute here, you'll find this is exactly the state plus, right? So this is how we define the different bases, and those bases should be orthogonal to each other, right? To do some measurements. Good. Well, so the X gate, actually, uh, which is the, the not gate, uh, you have seen that before, right? Okay. So I'm, I'm going, we have like 20 minutes, so it's okay. So the X gate, and it's defined in this way, and it's, it flip uh, the input state. So starting with the state uh, zero, uh, <coughs> and you apply a not gate on it. So we have zero, zero, one, one, uh, on the off diagonal, apply it to the state zero, then you see it flips from zero to one. And also if you have a state one, applying X gate, it will be flipped to the state zero. Okay, and uh, the Z gate actually, uh, which should generate a half turn uh, of the uh, of the rotation uh, on the Bloch sphere about this axis. So uh, it's basically about the phase. So if you think of those having some phase over here, then how this is how this uh, one is being flipped around the Z axis. So it's like a generic rotation around the Z axis. And of course, we know how to do this uh, control, right? From the radio oscillation and the magnetic field, then we know how to control these kind of things. How do you know that? Oh, good. Yeah, just. Yes, and uh, this is the this is the Y gate actually, and uh, we know actually how to do do this as well. Okay, so uh, we have a very generic uh, value rotation, which is the rotation, a very generic rotation on the three axes. So we could have, uh, we can define a generic rotation on the three axes uh, using this uh, general formula. So how can we, starting from this formula, how can we get this information, or how can we get this uh, formula from exponential to the cosine? We can actually define this uh, e to the power i theta a, uh, where you can expand this one and then you uh, 
reorder the terms, then you end up with this uh, e, to, uh, e to the power i theta a equal to the cosine theta i uh, plus i sine uh, theta a. I here is a matrix, so okay, it's a unit matrix, to just keep it in mention. Okay, good. And of course, this is the Hadamard gate. And the Hadamard gate actually is designed to put the qubit in a completely uh, superposition of the two states. So if you have this one here, it's 1 over the square root of 2, uh, 1, 1, 1 minus 1. If you apply that, then you will find that the output actually is 1 over the square root of 2, uh, the qubit in being in the, in the state of 0, and the qubit being in the state of 1. Okay? Yes? And now let's see how can we define the two qubit gates. So those are uh, single qubit gates, but how can we actually define the two qubit gate? So the two qubit gate, then we need the two quantum dots. And those quantum dots should be talking to each other. So they are not completely separated <coughs> from each other. So uh, this is the, uh, uh, like the experimental uh, scanning of uh, a material uh, that contains two quantum dots. And the separation actually between those two are over three micrometer. So you, you can imagine the scale of the quantum uh, computers that we are talking about. And uh, from here, you can find that those two, those two dots, actually quantum dots, they generate uh, two energy uh, or two uh, energy uh, welds here. So we have the E uh, here, and we have this epsilon. Uh, where it epsilon is the difference between the uh, the two uh, minimum or the ground state of the two dots over here. And now the question is, uh, can we control uh, by controlling only one qubit? Can we control the second qubit or not? Right? We can do that. Like having only one qubit, if we control this qubit, we could also control the other qubit. And this is where the idea of the entanglement comes from. So the definition of the entanglement is that. We cannot describe each state differently. We cannot do that. OK, so no, 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 no. <laughs> no. So how can we uh, actually controlling the first qubit, which is called the control qubit, we have some effects on the target qubit. How can we do that? Well, so we have many things over here. So we have the width. Of this, uh, uh, of this one here, of this. Uh, huh? Ah, oh, yes, uh, yeah, of this barrier, yes. So we have the width of this barrier, uh, and uh, you have the energy, this one, and also you have this epsilon. So uh, having the uh, control qubit in the, in the upper state, if you just increase up the energy of both of them, and you uh, increase the width of this barrier, then there is no effect, uh, like the spinning effect from this one to this one. Then you can prepare to the two qubits in the, uh, in the in the first state. So both are are, are in the uh, in the zero states. But now, if you have your control qubits in the in the in the, uh, in the zero state in the high energy state, and you just decrease the width of the barrier, the, of the barrier, then this guy feel the spin of the other one, so it flips. Same as here, same as here, just lowering the energy, right? So this is how we only controlling one qubit, which is called the control qubit, we could have effects on the target qubit. Another thing here, which is called the swap, the swap gate, how can we construct the swap gate? It's just having a very big difference of epsilon. So like one, this the energy of these dots is very, very high than the other dot, and then the electron can tunnel from one dot to the other, but According to the null exclusion principle, the other one will turn on the other, on the other. And this is what's called the swap gate. Okay, so the two qubit system, how can we define a two qubit system? Theoretically, you now we, we saw experimentally how to construct an entangled state, a two qubit entangled state, but now how can we define that third qubit? So we have the psi and the psi actually wave function that uh, describe uh, two qubits. And then uh, <coughs> two qubits mean we have a four states. Uh, and then these states or these spaces uh, can be defined as the following. So the first state is nothing but the tensorial product between the zero state of the first qubit and the zero state of the second qubit. 
and if you do that then you have that the uh, the, uh, the description now of the first state uh, of the entangled field is one and the, all of them are zeros for the one zero states uh, just repeat that one you can find this expression for the uh, zero one state and for the one one state is exactly the opposite of the zero zero states yes, please. so now you can construct what's called the control uh, not gate which is in short it's called C not gate so you know this kind of things, right? Or not? Yeah. Huh? This is uh, as Dr. Figgy. You have seen these kind of things, right? Yes. So uh, the C not gate actually it has the control and the target qubit, and uh, it has a mod plus uh, some entanglement here. Uh, so this is uh, we are in a like in a four basis. So this is a four times four function uh, matrix. And if you apply this matrix to the uh, to this uh, side that we've just constructed in the first slide, then you find that if the control gate in the state one, mm -hmm. it will act on the second. Uh, it will act on the second qubit. Like for example, here we flip the states, right? Good. So if if the control qubit in the state zero, the target qubits will remain the same. If the control qubit is in the state one, the target qubit is going to be flipped. So here, you see, now this is zero, zero, nothing. The control gate is uh, silent here, is just like it's flying to this uh, state. And then uh, for the second one, the control qubit is the state zero, then the, the target qubit, it also remains the same. But if the control qubit here is in the state one, then the target qubit is going to be flipped, as you can see. Same here, if the, if the control qubit is in the state one, this the target qubit is going to be flipped. So this is how we do a control not gate. Yes. There is also another swap gate, but I'll not talk about this anymore, but this is very, very important for those who is going to continue in uh, quantum computation and specifically in quantum machine learning. Swap gate is very, very important because it used to measure what's called the fidelity or the quantum fidelity. Anybody knows about quantum fidelity? Yes? Measures how, uh, how close two quantum states are. Yes. So, and it uh, has a measure from 0 to 1. If it's 1, then they are the identical. Yes. And if uh, they are it's 0, then they are completely the opposite. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. And this is how we do uh, uh, and uh, just measure uh, the uh, the similarity of the two states. Like how my state, like for example, I have a state, I prepare it in the state zero, and then I do some operation, and then I want to actually to measure the states. Uh, like for example, I want to my, uh, the measured state to be in the state one, so I can prepare or compute the quantum fidelity, and that tell, tells me actually where exactly my qubit is in, in which state my qubit is. And then we can control or compute the fidelity, uh, using the swap gate, and I show you uh, in, the, in the previous slides how can you do a swap gate from the experimental side. Okay? Yes. Well, so now uh, how can we do measurements? That's important, right? So we know uh, we know now how to uh, control the qubits. How can we uh, do some gate operation on the qubit? How the evolution of the qubit looks like? But we don't know at the moment how can we do. It. So I can measure the qubits, the state of the qubits. Well, so we can do that using the Elzerman measurement. And uh, this Elzerman is called Elzerman measurement because of the name of the first author of the paper. So it's called Elzerman. Uh, and uh, this is uh, very simple. Uh, it's uh, just like we uh, measure the current. Uh, this is a very old technique that's never been used nowadays. Uh, there is also another measurement. So it's called the Vengesso measurement. The measurement. So if you are interested, then go and look uh, how, it, uh, how it works. Uh, but it's okay. So Alzheimer's measurements, which is uh, one that introduced in 2004, and that says, okay, if the qubit is in the state, uh, the high energy state, just that there is, there is a current, and then uh, I can feel okay, I can measure only the electron in the high, uh, high energy state, not in the lower energy state. So as far as the electron in the high energy state, then I can make a measurement, and then I can uh, do some yeah, estimation or knowledge about the state of the, of the qubit. Yes, please. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> I 
my style on the <laughs> Okay, so now we know all the components, uh, everything, like uh, how we just uh, prepare the qubits and the zero states, how we do some gate operation on the qubits, how to measure the qubits or the, the state of the qubits. Now let's put everything together to do the variational quantum circuit which is the circuit that can be used to analyze a non segregable data, which is exactly the quantum version of the classical neural network. Awesome. Oh, it works. OK, good. So uh, as I, as I, this is the, 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 the slide that I've, uh, I just discussed on the, on the first lecture, which is the introduction. And uh, as you can see here, we have to prepare the qubits in the zero states. And then, uh, we do some feature map. So we embed the data, the classical data, on the qubit. But how can we do that? Uh, there are a different bunch of stuff, like the basis embedding, amplitude embedding, and angle embedding. And then here, we can do all the kind of operation on the qubits, like rotation, flipping, uh, swapping, whatever we want. And then at the end, we uh, measure the, uh, the, uh, the output of the qubit, or the expectation value, uh, using some Z gate uh, or some uh, Bali Z operation. And uh, as you can see, the, uh, the, the measurement actually ranges from minus one to one. So if the output is very close to one, that means the, uh, the point belongs to the first class. If it, uh, the probability or the measurement uh, of uh, this one, of the expectation value near to minus one, that means it belongs to the second class, like the input, uh, input data over here. And then, once we have the measurement, what is the second step that we can do? Huh? After we do, after we get the prediction, what is the next step? No. Huh? Before we iterate, there is a one step. What we have to compute? Loss. Huh? The loss. The loss function. We've said that. This is several lectures. We are talking about the loss function. Right? So we make a prediction, compute the loss function, having the optimizer, update the weights. Right? Okay. So as far as we have the uh, the, the expectation value or the predictions. Then we can build the cost function, and then we use optimizer to update the weights again. Exactly similar to the uh, classical machine learning. OK, good. So there are, as I said, there are different types of encoding, uh, like uh, mapping the classical data on the qubit. Uh, one of them is called the basis encoding. And from its name, it's uh, that we can prepare, actually, the qubits to add the point on the basis like either in the state 0 or the state 1. And in this case, I can code or encode only one classical weight on one qubit. So one feature for one qubit, because I can put my input either in the state 0 or the state 1 of the qubit. And this is what's called the basis embedding. Uh, on the other hand, I can use the amplitude encoding. And for this encoding, I could have the probability like alpha 1 state 0 plus alpha 2 state 1 as my classical data. And then I can add actually uh, data on the uh, amplitude or the probability of how uh, the qubit has been rotated uh, like this. And for one qubit, I can use two features, right? Because you can actually uh, write down your qubits or the wave function of the qubits, like this side. Uh, you can write this side as alpha 1 state 0 plus alpha 2 state 1, right? Right? <coughs> Right, you can do that, right? And those alpha 1 and alpha 2 are your classical data. So for one qubit, we can include two features. And this is how it looks like here. So if I have three qubits, no, three input features, then we need more qubits, right? So for three features or three, three classical data, we have, uh, we need two qubits. And for the two qubits, we have how many states or how many bases do we have? Four, right? So, and for we have only three classical data, so we can embed those cl three classical data to the first state, second state, and third state. And for the fourth state, I can bed it. 
So you remember the value, right? So I can add zero. So I, this I, uh, how I got the quantum machine learning. For the angle encoding, uh, you can see that how, like as we say, uh, we have this uh, cosine. Uh, also, you can write down the state as uh, semi state actually as uh, cosine theta uh, over two state zero plus sine theta uh, state one and uh, theta over two. And then you can include also uh, one uh, feature or one classical data uh, as the rotating angle of the unit. So amplitude, the amplitude encoding is like two bits? Yes, for one qubit. Mm -hmm. While the angle embedding is only one, uh, like uh, one bit. Okay. I have a question. Yes, please. Shouldn't, uh, shouldn't the qubit be normalized? Of course. So for the amplitude embedding, you should normalize. Okay. Of course, yeah, I forgot to say that. Yes. So how, how can we do you just didn't normalize. You just normalize your input, your classical data. So, so you always have this one over square root two. Your classical data. So I have two amplitudes. Like their squares must add up to one, right? Yes. So you have alpha I'm one. Not, I'm not considering. Alpha one, alpha I'm two. not considering the the, the the right? Yes. I'm only considering the amplitude. Yes. The, the magnitude. Yes. So if I have two magnitudes here and the, uh, the sum of the squares must add up to one. So actually, I have one degree field here. I, I can put one bit of information. Right? Uh, 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 uh. Uh, in principle, in principle, that's it to rule. Uh, that's true from. Uh, but you still, I mean, uh, you add some information after that, right? So you can see this from the normalization point of view, okay? So if you normalize, then you end up with one degree of freedom. This I agree with you. But you still have to do more and more operation on the qubit. So you have to rotate the qubits, and then after that, you do more unitary operation on the qubit, and so on and so forth. So as far as you keep. Um, no. Uh, it's okay. Okay, so here how the amplitude looks like. So you keep here the first point and second point, right? So he said now if you normalize, you still here in some one dimension, right? So this is due to effect of normalization. So maybe one, if you do not normalize, maybe one here and one in the other side here or one here. But due to normalization, it restricts your input data to be on one, uh, like in one dimension of the, uh, of the qubit. But still, even if the one point here and one point there, you still can access them so for example here I have okay so how, how, you, how you normalize the inputs so now you, you just normalize those two such that the sum is one that's it you just normalize your input data and then you can apply now the data in here so this classical data has to be normalized before you you make an, uh, you uh, you do this method. It's what the problem is. I mean, I mean no, no. If you if you have some doubts, maybe your colleagues can also have some benefits from this discussion. But I I, I see like in my humble opinion, I see with, uh, with an explicit example. This explicit example. Here. But this is not a, this is not a normalized. That's true. I agree. I agree. That's my fault. Uh, yeah. Okay. And one 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 more thing. Uh, a two qubit system can easily uh, uh, store three inputs or three features. Three it should store two. <laughs> Sorry. It should store two two features. Right. Why? This is the basis. It depends on how you store your uh, your data and how you map your data. So if you only map your data on the basis only, or on the angle embedding, like you rotate your qubit with one specific angle, then the U qubit actually it can access only one, one, one input data, or one input feature. But here, you can use two. Here, this is how it maps, how it looks like. This is a two. Here, this is the basis embedding. So either on the first state, on the, this is state, on the, or on that state. So as far as you have like for three data, three classical data, we need three qubits. For the angle embedding, it's nothing, but you just rotate 
the qubits with the given inputs here. And this actually is a screenshot uh, from, uh, yeah, even here, you see? This is encoding, binary string representation, and this is how you embed your data. Amplitude encoding of unit length. So you see this from a Maria Schul paper, a um, Maria Schul book. So that book I mentioned in the introductory uh, 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 lecture, uh, where you can find that this is the second book that I mentioned. But I think we have only two minutes to finish. So if you want, actually, you can uh, take more uh, like details of the uh, reading uh, in that book. You find this uh, discussion. What's the name? Maria Schul. I, I just mentioned those books in the references in the first lecture. So if you go back, you'll find it. I think it's a second. Yeah, please go. OK, so uh, here, this is the last thing that I wanted to mention, is that uh, in the uh, back propagation, right? So we said that, OK, we need to update the weights. For the classical machine learning, we update the weights by what's called the back propagation. But do you think that back propagation in quantum machine learning in quantum circuit can happen or not? No, we cannot. Because we cannot get compute the gradient. Uh, as a chain rule, because we, we don't have any information about the interference effect that takes place inside the quantum system. So, although uh, on the other hand, we cannot, uh, as far as we cannot use this uh, uh, gradient descent method actually to compute the gradient with the chain rule, uh, we replace that by what's called parameter shift rule. So, in here, you repeat the measurement twice, and uh, you just take the average, and this is how the uh, the gradient is decoded. Yes. Uh, the last thing is what's called the Baring Bula 2, and Baring Bula 2 is exactly the same as the vanishing gradient in the, like this is one version of the vanishing gradient in classical machine learning. So as far as you keep uh, more complexity in the data and your circuit, like you increase the number of the qubits, you, you repeat, you do more operation, you add more and more gates, then the most likely uh, the gradient uh, of uh, your quantum gradient is going to vanish. And the, the Baring Bula 2 actually is exactly uh, the quantum version of the vanishing gradient cost commission yes. Okay, so now let's go coding, and that was my plan, uh, but uh, we don't have any time, so please, uh, if you go to this, uh, in my GitHub, you'll find that all the uh, plots and everything that I mentioned here, stored in a one folder called the codes. So if you open up this folder, you'll find a lot of uh, notebooks, it's a Python, iPython notebook, uh, you'll find at the beginning, uh, like, uh, you can code this on the Google Colab, which is uh, free. So if you just uh, press this button, then you have to uh, just jump to the Google Colab, where you can repeat and access all of this information for free. That's what means. Okay, and thank you for your attending lecture, and uh, maybe see you next time after a couple of years, not next year. So, any questions so far? Okay, good.